Our next speaker is our MC for the day, uh, uh, Stuart Lawton. And um, he's actually, uh, some of you may know him, he was actually one of the original founders of Canadian Brass. And uh, that's why he, and he plays other instruments, including the harmonica. And I can tell you, he's exceptionally good. Um, you should uh, Google them on, uh, on, uh, on YouTube, and you can see some videos of him playing in the Allura Gorge. Um, I thought maybe I'd introduce him uh, by just explaining how I met him for the first time. Mary Lou Ambrosio from the International Free Press Society asked if I would like to go to a synagogue in Hamilton where they were holding a memorial service for the Fogel family that was so brutally slaughtered in, in Israel uh, and pretty much ignored uh, around the world, I guess, because they were Jewish victims. Uh, so we did drive down to Hamilton um, and we attended the service. The fellow giving a, a speech, one of the speeches that day was a fellow by the name of Gary Jarofsky, uh, and he was from something called the Never Again Group. And halfway through a speech, I said, I, I have to post that on Voice of Canada because I have a blog called voiceofcanada.ca. And uh, I, I introduced myself, and of course, I, I did post it. Uh, I happened to meet this tall, lanky guy named Stuart. And uh, I just, we just started talking a little bit about who we were, and I talked to him about Caledonia. And as the more I would talk to him, I'd say, oh, I don't want to bore you here. We're at, you know, this was after the service was over. And he would say, uh, so no, 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 tell me more, tell me more. So then he'd call, call over somebody else from the Never Again group. And then he'd call somebody else, and he'd call somebody else. And by the time we were done, um, the, I think there were about eight or nine of, of, of the member of, members of the Never Again group were all in a semicircle, uh, and I was giving them Caledonia 101. Now, I had reached out to uh, Jewish groups in the past, uh, a couple of them actually, um, one of whom said, gee, it was really horrible what was going on in Caledonia, but unfortunately, you know, when I asked, you know, could you help open some doors for us, this is going back in 2007, um, when we were still being smeared as neo-Nazi white supremacists. Uh, so, you know, I kind of understand it, um, but it was a really, it was a great pleasure. To, I, I was just in awe of these people in this synagogue who were willing to listen to what, to the pain of the people of Caledonia. Uh, I was just profoundly touched by them. Uh, eventually, you know, we, we went out for soup afterwards, and uh, later, you know, some of them, I, I think, I know Stuart's bought uh, Helpless, read it, and you can hear that in his remarks, his introduction, which were very kind. Um, I, I, Stuart's a really, really special, special individual, uh, as all the members of the Never Again group. Um, when they say never again, they really mean never again. And um, it, it, I j I'm just profoundly grateful to them. So I hope you'll give him a warm welcome. Thank you. Stuart Lawton. Thank you, Mark. Ten years ago, I took my first steps to becoming a political activist, although I had no way of knowing this at the time. Now, along with music, for I am a musician, politics threatens to dominate my life. It's been a fascinating and stimulating intellectual odyssey, one that I would not have missed for the world. The cataclysmic events of September 11, 2001, had an enormous effect on me, and I began reading voraciously across the political spectrum. I wrote letters to newspapers, then started contacting those who had had letters written. One of my calls led me to the Never Again group, NAG, a Hamilton-based collective dedicated to supporting the state of Israel and making the connection between what happened then, the Holocaust, and what is happening now. Nag also tells us why we should all care. People wonder whether I'm Jewish. I'm not, but that's hardly the point. If only Haitians cared about Haiti, that country would have received precious little recent international aid. I have no religious affiliation, in fact, and I haven't even visited Israel, but over the past decade, a pattern has emerged. I find that opinions about Israel are reliable predictors of clarity of thinking about global issues, with some people thinking rationally and others getting everything backwards. Yes, backwards. The United Nations Human Rights Commission has tabled more resolutions condemning Israel than all other 191 UN member countries combined. Of course, this is backwards. Anyone insisting that, say, Honda Civics 
caused more accidents than every other make and model of vehicle on the road combined would be laughed out of the room. But a comparably idiotic position adopted by the UN is received with solemn consideration. Why? One reason is the imposing presence at the UN of the 57 Government Organization of the Islamic Conference, OIC, a voting bloc that frequently demonizes Israel and uses the UN to shield its member states from scrutiny. Some people deplore Israel's insistence that it be recognized as a Jewish state. They say it's exclusionary, it's racist, but they're silent about the OIC's 57 countries who self-identify, obviously, as Islamic. Why should one country in the world, in its ancient homeland, not call itself Jewish? The OIC, by the way, is the world's second largest international organization after the UN itself. In population terms, we're talking about six million people against the OIC's one and a half billion. That's 250 to one. Our universities and our elite opinion makers are largely in thrall to a mindset that regards transnational global organizations such as the UN as somehow elevated, despite being comprised mostly of non-free states. Like many of us, I was imprinted with warm, fuzzy feelings about the UN as a child, carrying UNICEF boxes around at Halloween. It took me years to see that the UN has become something else entirely, a fatally flawed organization that empowers dictatorships by putting every nation on an equal moral footing. And once you get stuck in the tar pit of moral relativism and political correctness, you forfeit individuality and freedom of thought. For example, many of our best and brightest consider Stephen Harper a less admirable individual than Fidel Castro. Despite the firing squads that enabled Castro's regime and his iron-fisted rule of an island prison. Capitalism has raised more people from poverty than any economic model known to man, but is reviled for not being perfect. Christianity's sins are reflexively enumerated, but it is unthinkable to discuss the ways in which Islamic jihadists use the texts and teachings of Islam to justify violence. Of course, it requires no courage to denounce democracy or Israel or Christianity. Knowing you're not going to get your head bashed in is a big part of the appeal. Commentators from Golda Meir to Benjamin Netanyahu have insisted that if Israel put down its arms and said, we will fight no more, there would be an immediate destruction of the state of Israel with mass murder of Jews. But if the Arab states were to put down their arms and say, we will fight no more, there would be peace. Anyone who has read the inflammatory statements of Mahmoud Ahmadinejad and the leadership of Hamas, Fatah, and Hezbollah knows this truth. That it is not recognized as such is because political correctness does not, cannot recognize evil. We are loath to admit it, but evil can, evil can be present in any society on earth. It is a temptation we all fall into from time to time. To do what seems generous in the short term and to extend consideration to others, especially those perceived to be different from us. A much more challenging stance is to consider what the unintended long-term consequences of such generous instincts might be, and whether these results might still be good. This is the opposite of political correctness, and it is essential, in fact, because history has never been politically correct. What Israel is facing now is an evil that will threaten all of us, sooner or later, an existential threat to the values of the Enlightenment, of Western society. The evil is Islamic supremacism, which seeks nothing less than to dominate everyone on earth. To an Islamic supremacist, our Western freedoms are mere obstacles to be overcome on the way to a global totalitarian state. They proclaim this repeatedly. Last fall, though, NDP foreign affairs critic, critic Paul Dewar objected to Stephen Harper's statement that the major threat to Canada is Islamicism. 
Mr. Dewar said that the 10th anniversary of 9-11 should be a time for reflection on how we can build a more inclusive society to end extremism. But we already live in the most exclusive society in world history, with gender equality, gay rights, official multiculturalism, freedom of religion, Olympics for the disabled, and on and on. The threats to us come from the least inclusive societies on Earth, which want to remake our society to be just like theirs. It's because we're inclusive that they hate us. Israel Apartheid Week, or IAW, has just concluded at universities across Canada. At these events where the definition of apartheid is bent out of shape in an attempt to demonize Israel, we constantly encounter claims about Israeli settlements on disputed lands, with critics of Israel calling these lands occupied. But when Israel and an Arab state were created side by side, in a 1948 compromise approved by a two-thirds UN majority, there were no occupied or disputed territories. These resulted solely from the tug of war resulting from the failed five-nation Arab invasion of Israel in 1948 and the failed three-nation Arab invasion in 1967. Absent these two wars of aggression and related um, provocations, there would be no conflicts over settlements and no disputed territories. A great deal of attention is focused at IAW on Gaza. Yes, there are stark economic differences between Israel and Gaza. And this is a source of anguish to many Israelis. But Israel benefits, let's remember, in countless ways from the same freely functioning society and democratic governance that has created huge economic expansion here in the West. That's why the Israeli desert blooms. Gaza's incompetent Hamas government, on the other hand, pays lips, lip service to the suffering of its citizens while pursuing the goals of its founding charter, which calls for the obliteration of Jews. The highly vocal representatives of Canada's Hamas support network will never acknowledge it, but it's not banks universities, and repaired sewers that Hamas longs for, but more dead Jews. That's why Gaza is what it is. And what are we to make of global luminaries such as Desmond Tutu and J Jimmy Carter weighing in on what they regard from their lofty perches as Israel's sins? I used to admire these people. I think now of Jimmy Carter as a sort of canary in the coal mine, signaling danger any time I'm inclined to agree with him. And there was a time I did agree with Carter. I remember wiping away a joyful tear or two watching his inauguration on television. Finally, hope and change after the darkness of the previous administration. Mr. Carter predicted in 1977 that we could use up all of the proven reserves of oil in the entire world by the end of the next decade. He was diabolically anti-Israel and regarded Yasser Arafat, founder of the terrorist PLO, as a powerful human symbol. He called America one of the world's great abusers of human rights, but broke bread with Kim Jong-il and Fidel Castro. He trusted North Korea not to develop a nuclear weapons program. That worked out well. And he had Iranian Islamists shouting death to Carter long before anyone had heard of George W. Bush. Impressive stuff. And Jimmy Carter, winner of the Nobel Peace Prize, has authored a book about Israel and the Middle East titled Peace, Not Apartheid. Words fail me. I'm a humanitarian, not an anti-Semite, declares the activist raising funds for a boat to break Israel's weapons blockade of Gaza. I'm helping the poor Palestinians who live under brutal occupation. But as a friend of mine, the blogger Skaramouche says, if your loathing for Israel has become irrational, verging on the pathological, does it really matter if you hate Israel because you harbor the best of intentions? because you want justice for Palestinians whose lands has been stolen by colonialist Jews, or for the worst reasons, because you're an out-and-out -out Jew hater and unrepentant Islamists like Ahmadinejad, if what you want most in your heart of hearts is for Israel to simply cease to be. 
That, ladies and gentlemen, is the magnitude of the threat. In closing, and thank you for listening, here are my top 10 reasons Israeli apartheid is an insult to your intelligence. 10, I'm starting at the bottom. You are supposed to look critically at only one-sixth of 1% 1 of the Middle East, Israel, and ignore the rest. You are not supposed to know that a majority of Arab residents of East Jerusalem said they would move to Israeli-controlled West Jerusalem rather than live under a Palestinian Authority government. You are not supposed to know that Gaza has two Two borders. Israel closes one to keep bombs out. You're supposed to hate that one. And Egypt closed the other to keep people out. But you're supposed to ignore that since the population on both sides is Arab. You are not supposed to know that 20% of Israeli citizens are Arab, that people of all religions enjoy full citizenship with free health care for all. They also enjoy freedom of worship, can travel freely, serve in the government and on the courts, can own property and sit together in cinemas and restaurants. But this is no reason to think that Israel is good. You're not supposed to question why there is no Israeli spring or why no Israelis feel the need to throw off the chains of oppressive government. We're down to number five now. You're not supposed to know that as bad as apartheid South Africa was, it wasn't genocidal like Hamas. Its founding charter calls for the obliteration of Israel and the killing of Jews everywhere. <clears throat> and that, in fact, it's the Palestinian Authority that comes closest to the definition of an apartheid. The PA has declared that no Jew will ever be allowed to live in a Palestinian state. Four. You're not supposed to know that the only safe place for gays in the Middle East is Israel. Ever wondered why there are no pride parades in Syria, Lebanon, Saudi Arabia, or Gaza, or why Iran's president says there's no homosexuality in his country? Three, you're not supposed to question why so many leftist feminists in the West complain endlessly about gender injustices here, but remain silent on the barbaric treatment of women in many Muslim states. Two, you're not supposed to talk about Muslims killing Christians in Saudi Arabia, Somalia, Pakistan, Iran, Nigeria, Egypt, Yemen, and Sudan. They're also killing and intimidating Hindus, dynamiting ancient Buddha statues, and most of all, of course, killing each other. And number one, you're not supposed to realize that if you are liberal, socially advanced and freedom-loving, there is only one country in the Middle East that has always shared your values. Thank you.